But now I don't see those gobbles and cubs. I don't hear the blues anymore. Rough Trade is giving away a third off the first three months of the Rough Trade Club plus new music membership exclusively to 101 Part Time Jobs listeners. Become a member of Rough Trade Club New Music and you'll receive the Rough Trade Album of the Month straight to your door every month on exclusive vinyl pressing with exclusive bonus material. Club members have received exclusive pressings of albums from Sufjan Stevens, Sprints, The Last Dinner Party, Julie Byrne and Over Mono, just to name a few, this past year alone. Sign up using the promo code CLUB101POD and you'll get the Rough Trade Album of the Month, English Teacher's excellent debut album, This Could Be Texas, on exclusive Galaxy Gold for a third of the usual price. Here's English teacher on a recent episode of 101. How many opportunities do you get to write a debut album and have and have all of this, you know, sport behind us? I don't know, I really like the idea of holding the bar as being like classic songs. Now you only get one shot at a debut. <laughs> Don't want the album of the month, but still want all the benefits? Sign up to the standard tier using Club 101 Pod, and you'll still get the first month free. You'll also get free shipping on all orders, 10% off the bar and on secondhand vinyl in store, and exclusive access to sold out Rough Trade events. So don't hang around. Go to roughtrade.com slash club and sign up with the code club 101 pod. That's club 101 pod and claim money off the album of the month English teachers, this could be Texas. Today, this offer is available to UK residents only. Do you play in bands? I did for the longest time. And I wish that I knew that DistroKid was a thing. I don't even think it existed back then. DistroKid makes music distribution fun and easy with unlimited uploads and artists keep 100% of your royalties and earnings. A million plus artists rely on DistroKid to get their music on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, TikTok, Tidal, Instagram, and all the major streaming services. When you get DistroKid, you can see a DistroKid bank and withdraw your earnings. You get notified when you've earned royalties and you can withdraw via the app. And you can even check your streaming stats on Spotify Spotify and Apple. Get 30% off your first year on DistroKid by going to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod. 30% off for your first year. That's not bad. We know it's a tough world out there. Why don't you make it easier for yourself? And to get 30% off that free year as an artist where you get 100% of your royalties and earnings, go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash 101 pod. All right, stay with me. I'll be right back after this. The Vietnam War, it's over. Your job just begun. A new HBO original limited series. Welcome to the world of spycraft. Strap in. From executive producers Park Chan-wook and Robert Downey Jr. What are you concealing? Based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel by Viet Thanh Nguyen. What if I told you that I was a communist spy? How did you become this? The Sympathizer, streaming April 14th on Max. Subscription required. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Stuck between the carrying stick we stay stuck. All right, you're listening to 101 Part Time Jobs. It's the podcast where I speak to people who make cool things happen. On today's episode, we've got Dan Yeeman of Paint It Black. Uh, I'm going to try and keep this short because this episode is a lengthy one. Uh, my idea for this was to speak to him in three parts um, and try and get the story of Lifetime, his first band, Kid Dynamite, his second band, and Paint It Black, as well as Open City. So this episode is, uh, is split into three parts. It's the first time I've done something like this. It's the first time I've spoken to someone I probably know this much about or it's got to be up there in terms of how much or how long I guess I've been listening to uh, the discography of this guy I discovered Lifetime when I was 17 when that self-titled record came out and got mad into it me and my friends were, were just pretty much obsessed with it and got really into Swamps of New Jersey straight at the same time 
Um, and pretty soon after that, I got straight into Kid Dynamite. There was this band called The Steel in London, who I absolutely adored and still do. I've got a tattoo of their uh, Monopoly style light bulb on my arm. Um, and then, you know, Kid Dynamite were just this huge, I don't know, you know, you know it, was, it, was, it was a time of changes for me. I was 18. I moved to, to Brighton down from a London suburb to go study journalism and spent all my weekends going up north, getting the Megabus up to go to punk shows soundtracks those days with Painted Black with Kid Dynamite and Lifetime I spoke to Dan Yeeman now because Painted Black just released their first album in 10 years Famine the day it came out I was riding to West London on my bike about uh, it's about an hour away listen to it all the way there listen to it on my way back twice uh, it's just kind of been repeatedly playing I listened to it probably about five times in the first two days it's just <laughs> fucking unreal that track Dominion, down, 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 just <laughs> unbelievable. I love it so, so much that it makes me laugh. And yeah, here we go. Dan Yeeman of Paint It Black. Uh, before we get into it, 2000 Trees is a great independent rock festival. Cheltenham, two, two hours away from London, that's where it's at. Uh, tickets are on sale now. Gaslight Anthem is headlining. Who else? Hot Mulligan is playing. Uh, Creeper, they've just been announced. A Manchester Orchestra, Gouge Away, The Mysterines. Loads of brilliant bands still to be announced at 2000 Trees. There's a good mix of punk and hardcore and all other types of uh, alternative music. If you like Painted Black, you're sure to love some bands who are going to be playing 2000 Trees. You can get tickets now there at 2000trees.co.uk. Okay, before we get into this chat, I've got Rebecca from Eka and also Ampolo here. Ampolo is the first all-in-one app connecting a global community of musicians to practice, record and collaborate. And there's some new features coming on there, aren't there, Rebecca? You can start making money as an artist. Other artists can remix your songs. What's going on over there? It's quite exciting. You've heard it here first, but there'll be a place within the app you as an artist can sell your track and people can get creative with it so it's a new revenue stream for artists so it's very exciting a good thing to do right now is to create a profile get sharing and be there at the beginning all right and polo download it now thanks for bearing with with those adverts uh, that's the way i make money on the show and i can keep it going so cheers i appreciate that uh, here is dan yeeman from lifetime kid dynamite open city and Paint It Black, whose new album Famine is out now on Revelation, and it rips. Here we go. My parents only listened to classical music. And so for years, I mean, I, didn't, I never really heard anything else um, until, you know, that first time you're in a friend's parent's car driving somewhere or something like that, which... So probably, probably for the first seven years of my life, I didn't hear anything but classical music. Damn. Like what was the pre, the pre years of lifetime? What was your, what did your life look like that, at, you know, then how were you spending your days? What were you doing on a Monday? I was in, I was at university. In nearby in New Jersey? No, no, about 700, 600, 700 miles west in Michigan. So yeah, nowhere near, nowhere near New Jersey. No, I played in some bands in Michigan, but but we didn't do much, like a few gigs here and there. But mm -hmm. uh, those were my early experiences, I guess, playing original music. My the people I ended up playing with in, when I was at university, they had been in like a a really aggressive punk band in when they were in high school, and they were moving kind of away from that kind of intensity, and I was moving more into it. So we kind of mm -hmm. met at a at a weird crossroads where we were kind of working at odds with one another. But yeah. it was a really yeah. great experience playing with them, and I'm still I'm still in touch with them. Uh, after university, I came back. I moved back to New Jersey, and I was working. and uh, And then, you know, back then, that the way you found band members was you made a flyer and you put it up in the record store. Mm -hmm. The record store went where they sold punk records, not not just any record yeah. store. And so I think I cut out a bunch of like, I think I Xeroxed a bunch of pictures from like, maybe like punk, like punk records and, and, uh, and just wrote like what, 
I wanted to be influenced by and then I was looking for people to play with. And you just would leave mm-hmm. your phone number at the bottom. And, and then people would call or they wouldn't call, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's how I'm. That's how I met Ari, and that's how I met Chris Crispy, who was the first bass player. That's funny. Do you remember that kind of feeling going into you know, like meeting them for the first time and like sussing each other out in that kind of way that you know it just comes out in a, in an awkward, natural way. Yeah, I think I, I went over to Ari's. Uh, Ari was living with his mom, and I went over to his place and. We just like listened to records and looked at records. I think I brought my guitar and a practice amp, I think. But uh, but mostly we just talked about music and tried to figure out what we might want to do. He had been a drummer and he wanted to try singing in a band. He had never sung before. Um, and what I remember about that and then the, the rest of the people. And then when I met Chris... Uh, he was just like the friendliest, most sincere seeming guy I'd met. Um, he was really just the, like a sweetheart and like really seemed to him, we seemed to embody like the, what I thought of as like the hardcore spirit, you know, he was like genuine he like called people brother and like, just like sweet and really positive. Um, and then I think Ari, uh, met Mari knew Scott and Chris who were, who became the other guitar player and the drummer. He knew them through other people in the scene because Ari had been like much more of a presence in the local scene. I had been going to shows a lot, but I didn't really know anybody. You know, I went, I was only home in the summer. So I'd be home from like for May, June, July, August every year. And I would go to shows like constantly with my friend Pete, who was another kid from my hometown who ended up being in lifetime too. Um, after Scott left. Um, so Pete and I would just go to shows constantly. We drive to Trenton or Connecticut or New York city or take the train to places. But I, he, he was the only other like hardcore kid I knew. And I was the only other hardcore kid. he knew. Um, yeah. But Ari, you know, had been in bands in New Jersey and had been going to shows and maybe even had put on a couple of shows and and he'd been going to shows pretty much nonstop for like his whole adolescence. So he knew a lot of people and I didn't really know anybody. So It's interesting that kind of transition of being someone who goes to those shows and doesn't necessarily feel like they need or should kind of walk up to someone and introduce themselves, you know, (laughs) like, Hey, I'm Dan. Hey, I'm Giles. Because Uh, as soon as you start kind of being involved in those shows, I mean, maybe it, that maybe I've answered that question myself there is that if you're, if you're playing in the opening band or whatever band on the lineup, or you're involved in putting on the show that you feel like more of a responsibility for the room, you know, you know, for the feeling of the room. So that's the kind of impetus to be kind, you know, to, to, to say hi to a stranger. Yeah, and I, I suspect one of the reasons Ari knew a lot of people is he lived in a really, like, a large suburb. That, and I think there were a lot of, like, punk kids in his high school. And also, they were skaters. They skated. So, like, you, mm. I think that was the way you met a lot of people. Um, I didn't skate. And quite frankly, hard, the hardcore shows we went to in the late 80s were usually not friendly environments. Um, right. You know, they're intimidating. I found them like to be mostly intimidating environments. I mean, I loved the music and I was all in, but I, it didn't feel like a place I was going to make friends. <laughs> that was my initial, like before I was in a band and started meeting a lot of people, that was my experience. You got to remember like in 1988, 1989, there were Nazi skinheads at every show, like just like, and just, it was an intense environment. Do you remember a time when it, when that stopped, you know, when that, when that, that, that sort of aggressive, um, sinister feelings would sort of, where there were like, was there a time when you realized that kind of horrible feeling was, was leaving those rooms? Was there a, a crossover period where it became a bit more, you know, friendly? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think a number of things happened. I mean, first of all, like a bunch of 
at least in a lot of the areas around where we lived, um, there were other groups of violent people that, that basically beat up all the Nazis and chased them away. Although a lot of times th- those people, although I was grateful that they got rid of the Nazis, a lot of times those people ended up being, um, you know, sources of, of violence themselves. Mm. Um, but what I remember is in that once Lifetime was off and running is uh, we, we took a lot more responsibility for what the vibe was like in the room. Um, Mm -hmm. and had a larger group of friends that would kind of like put people in check if they were getting too, you know, if their, their behavior was like too aggressive or like, Mm -hmm. and I think the tone you set on stage has a lot to do with that too. So, so at a certain point, at least in our little community, we started to take a lot more responsibility for it. And then when the, the kind of the nineties DIY scene really exploded, like that was much more about, um, like it was much about political awareness as it was about aggressive music. And so the, the dialogues that were opening up around that were, were critical, you know, much more critical of violence. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think at least at certain times, and then the scene kind of seemed to split, you know, there was like the really aggressive, like kind of metal influenced hardcore. And then this, the more, um, the stuff that seemed sort of oriented in a different direction it was still like fast and aggressive, but not, not violent. I like, like d- leaning into that nuance between aggression and violence that, that like they're not the same thing. And that like, you can trust like the punks to know the difference. I think we do. Cause I've, uh, for, I was immediately attracted to emotional lyrics talking about, you know, as a Billy Bragg fan, you know, Billy Bragg sums up so well, you know, pop and love and politics. Yeah. That was such a big influence. You know, that's how I got in. That's kind of what I learned. Um, the, the music that I love, you know, that was kind of, those were kind of three mechanisms of it. And I was just thinking when you, when you talk about the, the, the aggressive shows and then lifetime shows, thinking of Ari's lyrics and the, the content in there and the storytelling in there, mm-hmm. um, it's a real juxtaposition, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. There was, I don't think, I'm not sure anybody else at the time was, was writing stuff like that, at least in our, in our scene and in the, the sort of the punk and hardcore world that I was aware of. And looking back on it now, there's sort of more, more stories come out over the years. Not too long ago, I read Dan Ozzy's sellout book. Mm-hmm. And there's that chapter of My Chemical Romance in there. And I was... I was really into that record and around that time gallows were a big thing for me. And that was when I saw lifetime for the first time and I'd never heard of you. And I went to see gallows at the mean fiddler, which isn't a venue anymore, got flattened by the new railway station in the Tottenham court road. And I missed gallows, but I saw you and I was standing in the second row and it was, it was awesome. I gave you, you know, I'd never heard you, you know, I hadn't heard you before, but I gave you a high five after the show. And you know, it's this, where, it's was, this, where was that? Sh- was that in Leeds? Or in, uh, in London. In London, okay. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember. Like we had we had broken up in 1997 and then started playing again in 2006. And we had been to Europe a couple of times in the 90s, but back then the conventional wisdom was, oh, there's not not really like the UK wasn't good for hardcore, so like right. it's not worth it to get the take the to take the boat, take the ferry over. What were your main of that, of that first period of lifetime, what were your, what are like the, the main, what's like the main memory that sticks out? I mean, I realize asking you these questions and, you know, finding out about these stories is that you, you can't fucking try and sum up something in 20 minutes or 10 minutes, you know, of, of an actual 10 year period, you know, yeah, but so I mean, were the, you generally like a happy person? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm generally a happy, optimistic person. I think, being in a band isn't always a happy experience, but it was like really thrilling to be making music that people connected with, you know, like mm. when we first started the band, I, I, you know, my hope was that like, Oh, maybe we could put a seven inch out someday and like maybe play shows like outside of our state someday. Um, so to be, you know, to be like putting out albums that people were like listening to all over the world and to be able to go to Europe. I mean, the first time we went to Europe, it was supposed to be a month, but they kept getting more and more requests for shows. So like we ended up going for nine and a half weeks. 
That's wild. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Were you all right? Were you getting paid all right for those shows? Were Was it like somewhat comfortable? Do you remember if, any of those feelings around that kind of stuff? Yeah, because the way they do things in mainland Europe is so much more... Uh, you know, it seems like the communities really value the arts and like having positive things for young people to do. So like so much, so many of the places we played were like really well equipped for traveling bands, you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the UK, most of the shows seem to be like, like in these upstairs rooms at pubs. Uh, But on the, you know, I'd say, okay, in, uh, in like, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, there were like youth centers in every community. And they yeah. were like, the youth centers like had like a, a, a live music room that could hold like, you know, like 300, 400 people with like a really good sound system. And they would have like a barracks upstairs where bands could take showers and, and sleep. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, each one of these youth centers is sort of run by a council of youth like young people that take responsibility for it and they're funded by the, the state or the city. And so yeah, yeah. they don't really have, they don't really have overhead. Right. So we would get to these, it, it would seem miraculous at the time. I don't, I don't even know if that system still exists, but we would it get does. to the, we'd get to the venue and they'd have food for us. They'd have like bread and cheese and fruit and like, and then they would be like, Oh, we're making dinner now, but here's some stuff for you to eat. And, you know, you can play pool or foosball or take a nap or take a shower or like mm-hmm. skate the skate ramp outside, you know, just chill. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, then we'll have sound check and then we'll have dinner for you. And then, you know, you'll sleep upstairs when the gig's over. And, and because those places are subsidized, I think by the community, like all the money that came in at the door, um, would go to the bands and, mm-hmm that the, those places were like the things for kids. So every kid in the community would know that like, that's where the shows were. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whereas like what we're, what you're, we're used to is like, they're always like scrambling to find places to put on shows and they, they get shut down and then, you know, and sometimes like pe- nobody knows where the shows are supposed to be or <laughs> the place that they're expecting the shows to be doesn't exist anymore. But, mm. um, so like that, that touring in like, I guess in Western Europe was really, and even some of Eastern Europe was like that too. Like check, uh, Prague had, had stuff like, had something like that, but it was at the university. Um, and then between that and squats, like we played a lot of squats, but those are organized. The experience was similar, except there weren't usually state subsidized. They were more like, um, invented by the ingenuity of the people that living like living there and yeah uh and that was a really exciting i mean just to see how people did like the whole practice of yeah diy punk in europe was pretty inspiring to see definitely i mean it has that knock-on effect of being like the message there is it's okay (laughs) you know start a band start a music project Here's a place you can do it. Yeah, I mean, we would roll up to these places and like, and it would be like this whole apartment block that was, you know, that had been squatted, and then part of it was, you know, oh, like this is where the uh, the barter only auto shop is, and this is where the volunteer daycare program is, and this is the you know mm-hmm. community theater we have going on here, and this is where we lock up the gates and throw bricks at the cops, and like. It was just like this, you know, just nothing like that in the States at all. And it was really eye-opening and and inspiring, too. It kind of reinforced our experience of what, like, was happening in the States with this sort of this explosion of DIY energy in the 90s. Mm. But to see how organized it was in Europe was really remarkable had your mind, do you think that you'd like sort of changed, you know, your mind had, had kind of been open to these, uh, options of what you could do and the kind of like, you know, the scalability of what you wanted to do. Were you even, were you thinking that far? I guess that's quite like, um, that's quite forward planning, you know, thinking, you know, we could build this sustainable world of which to live in. 
it made me think a lot more about alternative communities and intentional communities. There was so much going on. And, you know, right at that point in the States, there was just a lot more going on. You know, it seemed like everybody was doing a label or a fanzine. And, mm-hmm. and you know, people, that's when the, the this sort of explosion of uh, places like basement basement shows and shows in people's garages and and but not just one-offs like this this consistency like there was there were certain basements where there were shows like a couple times a week for several years and i don't even know how people sort of pulled that off but (laughs) um, yeah and and you know and there was much more of a you know they started having district like record distributions at shows like kids would just like start a record distribution company and start carrying like, yeah. So they'd be bring these boxes of records into shows. And like in the eighties, you had to go either go to a record store or, or, um, you know, I would mail order records. Like you'd see advertisements in maximum rock and roll and you just put $3 in an envelope and, uh, and you'd get a record back like four months later or something like that. So you must have um, felt like really empowering to be like, yeah, we can all just, of a sudden, yeah, yeah, all of a sudden kids are bringing these, there are all these huge tables set up at the back of a, of a show with these kids selling records that you would have had to like spend hours fought, tracking down and ordering from <laughs> across the country and across the world and seeing kids do that. I, I do think maybe, I do think that was probably inspired by people traveling to Europe to, to tour when you when lifetime kind of stopped do you know you wanted to keep playing music i mean i imagine I basically started kid dynamite as soon i mean lifetime decided we were on tour and we decided to stop just stop and i i started kid dynamite as soon as i got home Do you remember that conversation and do you remember like where your headspace was at? Mostly a conversation with myself at that point. Just like I felt, um, I felt like the rug was pulled out from under me and I was not like things were really going, things were like at an exciting point for a lifetime. And I think, but some, I think like half the band was getting burnt out on touring, you know, like it's hard. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think you can. There are a number of different ways you can experience tour, um, and I always tended to have this kind of wide eye to like, what an amazing opportunity to like see the world and play music for people far from home and connect with people in this in this way that most people don't understand and will never get mm-hmm. to see. But I think for other people, it's like really. Um, destabilizing to be away from home for long Mm. periods of time. And I think now with perspective, I understand that like tours, like tours, like pain can be really painful for a lot of people. They're homesick and, you know, they, they they don't feel like being away from things that are familiar disrupts their equilibrium in pretty, pretty profound ways. And, and you don't really know that until you're away for a long period of time. And I think, you know, people missed home. People missed, the, you know, their, the people they were in relationships with. And I, I did too. But for me, it was always any sense of homesickness I experienced was sort of overridden by how exciting it is to, to yeah. be able to. I just saw it as a priv- I saw it as a privilege. But I respect the fact that not everybody was experiencing it that way anymore. But I really felt like... Uh, like cut short, like cut short prematurely. And so I, I, and I had this sense, maybe it was just intuitive that if I didn't, if I stopped, I might just stop period. (laughs) So I had the sense that I needed to stay in motion. So I, I immediately started thinking about what band would be next and writing music. 
I also was in graduate school at that point. So I was working on my doctorate wow. and um, talk about a 101 yeah. day job, like 101 part-time jobs. So I had a lot going on, but I immediately started writing songs for what would be, what would become Kid Dynamite and trying to figure out who to play, who to play with. And it took a little while to evolve, but I would say I was very, uh, I was working hard on it for like, in, as soon as we got home from that last lifetime tour. How many months was it before you found that band and, you know, could, could it kind of work it out into the shape of, of a record of a band? Probably I would say we were a band sometime, you know, within six or eight months of getting home from that last lifetime tour. And the, the record came out, I mean, lifetime stopped in, I think the first, the early part of 1997 and the Kid Dynamite record came out. I have to look it up, but it was definitely 98. Wow. I mean, what you said there about not wanting to stop because you got to keep it in motion. I mean, that's how I listened to Lifetime and Kid Dynamite. You know, those albums, it's like setting fire to a piece of paper. You burn through that track <laughs> listing, you know? Yeah, especially the first one. Um, October 1998 and the uh, Lifetime sort of, self-destructed maybe in like March or April of 97. I mean, one thing that strikes me, I was listening to Hello Bastards today. Those albums sound good. Did you, you wanted to make it sound good? Did you, you know, there, there was none of this. There wasn't so much of this. Oh, we're a punk band. Let it just sound like whatever. It was there a lot of heart and think, thought thinking that went into that went into that, you know, like this is, this is how we're expressing ourselves as punks, as hardcore fans, as hardcore kids, but we want it to sound as good as possible or in, 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 you know, as good to our taste as possible. I don't know. I mean, I think everybody wants to sound good. You know, it's just a matter of like, like, I don't think, you know, the records that were coming out in the eighties, I don't think people were like, Oh, let's well, sound shitty. Right. I think it's, it's a matter of like, what, what kind of resources you have um, and that people in the 80s you know a lot of times didn't really know how to record punk bands you know so they were like but by the 90s you had people that really understood the sound you were going for if you're in a hardcore band and you go into a studio and the, the engineer's reference point for what rock sounds like is like Aerosmith or something like that like what, and, and you've got enough money to be there for one day what you know what do you think is going to happen but we were also really happy to have it sound rough. I mean, like, Hello Bastards, I think, sounds cool, but it still sounds pretty rough. It makes a difference how good headphones you've got. I was listening on these studio headphones, and it sounds a lot different to the headphones that, that I've had over my years, you know? Yeah, I always had, like, <laughs> good speakers in my room and bad speakers in the car. <laughs> it's the opposite. Well, it's good to be... Now people do the car test, don't they? You go listen to the mixes in the car. I go listen. I listen in three places. I listen on good headphones in the house, like on speak on stereo speakers and in the car. Did you know like when that, when you did that first Kid Dynamite record, was it, was it like, okay, we're going to go on tour. We're going to, you were ready to jump back in, go on tour, find new experiences. Was that, was that kind of you strapping in for your life outside of, you know, weaving that in with studying, were you, were you pretty serious about making stuff happen? Yeah, I had a plan and it was like, I had, I, I wanted to finish at that point. I was in my last year of, of my doctoral studies. And then in, in my field in psychology, you have to do a, a year of postdoctoral work before you can get licensed as a, as a psychologist. And so we were starting to dynamite when I was in my final year of school and just playing like weekends and stuff like that. Then I had to do my postdoc, my postdoctoral rotation, which was like more like uh, 10 and a half months. And you have to have a certain number of hours of working under supervision. And then you can sit for your licensing exams. And so I was going to do my hours, finish my hours. And then literally the plan was to go on tour as soon as I was done. <laughs> yeah. So I left, I, we, you know, we booked a tour and and I left my you know I finished my hours and I left my job and we went 
Um, and you know, but that was, that was pretty short lived because that was another, like we, we didn't have, uh, I think touring did, did kid dynamite in too. Right. Like, so, you know, a year later it was, I think we were done. I grew up in that kind of like pop punk era where like pop punk was like our, our, you know, our big rock or at least as young people, it was our big rock. Right. And I, I mean like rock music, you know, you turn on MTV two and you'd see green day on blink One Eight Two, And, and I think, and I've talked about this before in this show, cause it's interesting. I grew up with this mentality that I wanted to do everything myself and I was never afraid of getting my hands dirty and doing things. And there's also this kind of side where I kind of, I was up for playing at Reading Festival. You know, I was up for supporting bands that were maybe a bit poppier than us. And that was a conversation I would co sort of continue to have with people I've met sort of throughout my life, whether you should do particular things or, or, or more to the point, you shouldn't do particular things because they're not DIY or they're not punk because we live in like an overwhelmingly capitalist world right we do yeah and, and uh our art and commerce are uh sort of always overlapping but but often at odds with each other right it's like the reason i know about punk is because of commerce at the expense of people you know yeah, and that's a thing that I think only happened in, in the post-Nirvana world because there were no, like when we were getting into hardcore and punk, there were no um, public representations of it at all. So there wasn't even an option to do something that wasn't punk. You know, there wasn't even a... No, it was like, um, yeah, there was. It didn't, it wasn't a question. And um, so I guess it started with Nirvana, which would have been in 1990 and then... Green Day in 1994 or five. Mm -hmm. I mean, in England, you could have, you would have punk bands on the on top of the pops, so it was different. Yeah, I mean, the Clash had a manager before they had released the tune. Same with Sex Pistols. Yeah, I mean, the Sex Pistols were kind of created by a manager, if you think about it. Yeah. So, yeah. so even at its inception, punk was Malcolm. Um, punk was, uh, you know, if you want to be really cynical, maybe. <laughs> Malcolm created the Sex Pistols to draw more attention to his shop, right? Oh yeah, totally. Sex, um, but but I don't think that that in any way overrides the the stuff that like angry and disenfranchised kids made with that. You know no. that like the the Pistols and the Ramones and the Heartbreakers and Stooges and you know there was sort of like warning shots across the bow and people took it to heart you know people were like look what you can do without expertise with just energy and attitude and enthusiasm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are very individual i i received that information as a very individual um expression or task you know that's that's you that's your friends just because you might have been inspired by that thing over there that's on a giant glossy metal and glass <laughs> container but yeah. but w we can make something that feels good to us. You know, you can't, no one can tell you wrong. No one can tell you that you're doing wrong. Exactly. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, price line. So <laughs> painted black, did that did that form again out of Kid Dynamite it not feeling, you know, when Kid Dynamite stopped after touring, was, was paint a black a seed in your mind then? No, I think then I very much felt like I had been defeated. I was like, all right, you know what? Maybe this is a sign and I should just uh, stop worrying about bands and get on with my, my, like, finding a job I liked and that sort of thing. I mean, I, it's not like I'd always, I never really thought about 
a job and a band as an either or proposition. I just happened to be in school for like most of the time I was in bands at that mm. point. I was basically in, in graduate school for most of the 90s. So, and I was just doing both. Uh, we painted, so, oh, can, can down and I broke up, I was like, oh, maybe it's a sign. I'm just, uh, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I was working a lot. I was working like 60 hours a week. And in, in psychology, in that, in yeah. that field. Yeah. In like 2000 and 2001, like the end of April, 2001, I had a stroke. I ended up in the hospital and I was pretty young, you know, I was like 30, 33, maybe. Um, That's so, why. I mean, young, com young compared to me now, you know, I was like, and young has a lot to do, was le less to do with chronological age and more with just like, I basically just finished school and started working. I mean, I worked throughout school too, but, but, you know, like I, I just finished school and started a, you know, sort of a, what you could call a career oriented job. And then, mm. Um, so it still felt like, I felt like I was young. Yeah. I, like I'm I was a kid still. 32. I feel like I'm, I'm a kid. Could I ask Yeah. what, what spurred it on? You don't have to answer. I don't want to be. No, no, no I, don't, I don't care. It's not, no, I appreciate, I appreciate your, that res being respectful, but it's not, uh, it's not something I'm shy about talking about. It turned out I had, I have a, an autoimmune disorder that is pretty rare and, uh, affects like the clotting factor in bloods and red blood cells. Okay. It's a, a long name that I won't bore you with. Uh, but you know, that's the way I found out I had it is that I had a stroke. And then they, you know, when you have a stroke, they spend a lot of energy trying to figure out where but the kind of stroke I had is when a blood clot, uh, break, forms somewhere in your bloodstream and breaks off and floats up to the brain and blocks blood flow to a part of the brain. And so the symptoms are some kind of disruption in neurological function, you know, like, mm. um, some people have a, a physical effect. Some people have a cognitive effect. They become confused. Um, and for me, I went numb down the entire left side of the, my body. Like if you drew a line, literally right down the middle. Um, I went numb on the entire left side, but in this kind of subtle way. So it took me a while to figure out exactly what was going on. It wasn't like I couldn't feel anything. It was more like, I, like I could walk and pick up a pencil or, or a cup or something, but then something just felt off. And what I realized is that, um, like I could feel pressure, but it was more like, um, like if you, if you pinched me or stuck a pin into me, I couldn't feel that. Like if you, if you pushed your thumb like into my shoulder, I could feel that. I could feel you squeezing me. Mm. But if you pinched me or stuck a pin in me, I couldn't feel it. So it was a weird kind of numb numbness. Um, and then, uh, I started slurring my speech like, like hours later. Um, and I pretty much, you know, we, we have to study neurology, uh, in, as part of our psychology study. So I knew that then I really knew like, mm -hmm. Oh crap. So. And you, uh, did you tell people around you, were you living with housemates or, or family or no, I was at I was a, I was at work. Um, and I had two jobs at that point. And this job was, I was working in a counseling center at a university here. It was in a different part of the city from where I live. And I called the campus, the university security, and they would only take me to the closest hospital, which is a shit hospital that you don't want to get stuck at if you have anything serious. You could go there to get a cut sewn up or something, but not for anything serious. So one of my colleagues said he'd drive me downtown to the big university hospital. And he drove me downtown and there was something going on. There was a big, they have an annual uh, track and field competition at this university. And so there's, there's teams from all over the country coming to compete. And so the streets were filled, the, the exit on the highway was closed. So we had to take another exit and came around the back way. And then we get to the street that the hospital's on and we're like five blocks away. And I'm just watching the lights go from green to red to green to red and the car's not moving. And I, I look out and there's like the streets filled with buses, just like 
from all these colleges and universities all over the country. And I'm like, we're not going anywhere. And I said, Robert, I'm, I'm going to walk. <laughs> so I got out of the car and I walked the last like five blocks to the hospital. <laughs> and so you were like kind of cognizant. You, you, I mean, you clearly remember it. Were you, yeah, were you, yeah, I was very, you were all there. I was cognitively very sharp, but it was entirely the, 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 the area of the brain that it must have been in was like what you would call like the sensory motor strip uh, on my right, on the right side of my brain because it's my left side. And so, um, so it didn't affect my consciousness at all or my self-awareness. It was just, just what? sensory. And then a little bit motor when I started slurring. But that went, that cleared really fast. Um, so yeah, it was pretty scary. So what was the recovery of that? Like, how long are we talking for recovery? Uh, I got lucky. I didn't really have any serious damage. It, it, it um, yeah, it, it didn't, the clot must have broken up or something like that. It didn't. So what happens in when there's serious damage is it deprives part of your brain of oxygen for long enough that it starts to have permanent damage. And you can do, people do rehab, rehabilitation, and can get a lot of function back because, you know, the brain is still pretty um, resilient, you know, even when you're fully grown. But I got lucky. I didn't have permanent damage, so I was okay after a few weeks. But I had to take, I had to take blood thinners probably forever. Do you remember, like, after that, was did that have an impact of you playing music and 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 touring? well that's why I, that's why i started well i wasn't in a band i hadn't been in a band in like two years and then uh that's when i knew i had to start a band again. <laughs> because like, you know it's like i i was i was ready to be done with music and i was just working hard and i, I love my work don't get me wrong but mm. um but I also realized, you know, when you, when you have an experience with mortality like that, because my doctor was like, you just got lucky. Like I, I was telling myself that because I was like, I'm really healthy and I'm in good shape and I'm like a vegan and work out all the time that like, that's why I had such a good recovery. And my doctor was like, you're telling yourself a, a story that's not true. Like you got lucky. You could have just as easily like, you know, half a centimeter in the other direction, you could have just like lost everything. Um, and I took that to heart and I was like, okay. Um, like it didn't lead me to question my choices for education and career. That's remained a constant, but it did, uh, very quickly make me rethink sort of putting my life back in balance and making space for, because I, I knew I was missing creativity, making music and playing music. Um, but I just was kind of telling myself that that time was past. Um, but this was a wake up call. Not that it's a kind of a cliche, but I felt, I felt awakened. Like you, you've made some choices and you understand why you made them, but you're missing something that's really important in your life mm. and you need to wake up and get back to it. Mm. And that's how Painted Black started. Awesome. But I was also very conscious of protecting myself from the heartbreak of how Lifetime and Kid Diamond ended, which is why one of the reasons I ended up singing. I was like, well, if I write the music and I write the words and I'm the vocalist, someone can quit and I'll just replace them. <laughs> so it'll, the band will stop when I'm done with it. And that's, that's it. And that was part of the, that was part of the original premise. <laughs> Do you remember, you know, having that feeling of like, I'm missing playing in bands. Yeah. My sort of next step of thinking there would be to kind of like almost bullet point the things that make me feel good about being in bands. Did you have that moment? Could you kind of identify those things that like why or you know, you have an inkling why you feel so good about playing music. I mean, I'm an, it's about connection. I mean, my work is about connection and music's about connection, but you're connecting in a very particular way. Cause when you're connecting through art that you create, you know, there's another dimension to it. That's, it's hard for me to articulate, but it's, um, 
it's just really something special. Maybe part of it, I, I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but maybe part of it is because it's not something that everybody can do. I mean, in a sense, it is like the, the, the takeaway from, for me, from punk is that everybody can do it, but not everybody does. And there's, so there's something really special about it still. I'm a big believer in that everyone is really good at a certain amount of things, no matter who mm-hmm. you are. There are, there are a few things out there that you, the experiences that you've had in life the reflections that you've had in life, they, they put you in a position to be able to express yourself using these particular set of tools in a way that's fucking, that's, in a way that's very cool, in a way that, that, like you say, other people can do it, but they don't do it. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a really special thing. And also just to be able to refine it. Like, I'm not a good, I'm not good at playing guitar, but I'm good at, definitely good at writing songs. And now, you know, I'm, now the, the, line, the lineup of, Painted Black has been consistent since like 2007. And this, this group of people, you know, early on there was a lot of people coming and going. Uh, now I can say with confidence that if anybody left, I would stop, we would stop doing the band. It's not, it wouldn't be the same. Um, it would just be done. But, you know, we, we, I feel like I keep thinking maybe we peaked and then, we make another record and I'm like, no, not true. <laughs> like, I feel like I know it's, I know it's just hardcore punk, but like, I really do feel like we keep getting better at the process of making music mm-hmm. while still being really spontaneous. I mean, we write, you know, like I demo stuff on the computer, but then we need to get in the room together, you know, and like bang things out. And it just feels like, I don't want to stop because I feel like we keep getting better at it. If you'd have asked me a year ago, um, uh, would Paint It Black release a new record? I would probably say, I don't know. Are they broken up? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But, but you have been active. You have been writing, have you? Yeah. The whole time? Pretty much, yeah. So you've got the seven inches. And then Open City. Was Open City, was that, like, um, was that a good way to express yourself? In a- yeah, Open City was originally meant to be a band where, because, our, you know, Painted Black's drummer moved to California uh, in 2009, that year that we had the two, that we had those two seven inch EPs come out. Um, and so we were just much less active, you know, we mm-hmm. got another record four years after that. And we were playing here and there, weekends here and there. And Open City was meant to be a band where everybody lived in Philadelphia and we practice every week because I was really missing that. And so in some ways that I, I think also maybe took up a lot of my creative energy. So I wasn't maybe thinking about Painted Black as much, but I was always writing songs that, that would be Painted Black songs and I was writing words. Yeah. I just wasn't exactly sure where I was going to put them. I could so hear or I could vision you writing Famine or Dominion that don 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 and thinking and like seeing you be like yeah that's a fucking that's a bit <laughs> I'm keeping that bit <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of stuff gets kind of, our process is kind of like you know people ask like do, do you do you only keep the best bits and and were there extra songs that didn't make the record Usually the way it works in this band is um, the stuff that's not good, I tend to, I tend to self edit. So I would say like 95% of the stuff that isn't good enough, never makes it to prep, never makes it to anybody's ears besides yeah. mine. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the melodic bits, the, the kind of second half melodic, call them sing along if that's not too, you know, funny to say you know there's real sing-along yeah. bits it's, it's a real primary component of painted black isn't it yeah it's like a, even if we start out really nasty there's some kind of anthem yeah that's coming just around the corner hell yeah um i turned out to be really uh one thing i'm really another thing i'm not good at is keeping melody out like when we started the band i didn't want it to have any melody at all i was i was like 
thinking like Los Crudos or Poison Idea or something like that. But it turns out I'm not good at uh, keeping melody entirely out of the picture. <laughs> Love it. Hey, Dan, thanks so much. You know, when I yeah, reached out, I thought like, I want to try, try and sort of chart Dan Yeeman, you know, over the years through three bands over a, you know, a, a pretty extensive period. And uh, I feel like we've done a bit of, I've, we've, this has been a good punt at it, I think. There's, there's, yeah, I think we did all right. <laughs> we did all right. So there he was, Dan Yeeman on 101 Part-Time Jobs. I hope you've liked that as much as I did. If you like this show, you can subscribe, leave a rate or a review. Uh, all that stuff helps me massively, helps me, uh, helps me get more guests and, uh, you know, fill out the numbers so I can approach some brilliant people and, and get their stories. That's what I love to do here. I'm trying to get people's stories. I'm trying to share some interesting stuff that otherwise we might not ever know. Um, and I like doing it. Thank you so much for joining me. Be back tomorrow with an episode with David Holmes. See you then.